so much for that kind introduction. It's great to be here at such a wonderful conference and among so many fantastic leaders who are all working towards achieving lasting social change uh, through innovation and entrepreneurship. And I want to thank Sankal for creating this venue for everyone to come together, for those who share this conviction that enterprise-led development is a crucial way forward. Sankal has been instrumental in bringing about the in incredible growth that we've seen in this space in such a short time. So today I want to do two things. I want to celebrate and I also want to agitate. First, I want to celebrate with you all of the wonderful progress that we've made together uh, around impact investing and also social entrepreneurship. But I also want to agitate. And I know that's a strong word, but it's the kind of word you use in an opening address in the morning to get people's attention. Uh, I'm agitated about the challenge that all of us are experiencing in different ways. And that is the challenge of realizing scale. And how do we help entrepreneurs take some of their wonderful ideas to scale so we can help even more people? Let's start, though, with the celebration. What everyone is doing here is just amazing. Uh, and we at the Rockefeller Foundation have tried to do our part to support all the wonderful innovators and risk takers by helping grow the field of impact investing. Many years ago, we and others saw the possibility and necessity of unlocking capital from the private sector to address our most important social and environmental problems. We all know that governments and philanthropies will fall trillions of dollars short uh, of addressing the important challenges that face us. And we also saw at the same time an increasing appetite among investors who are increasingly starting to think about how do they realize social returns in addition to financial returns with their investments. So we spent more than 40 million US dollars in the first phase of our work to bolster the infrastructure for the impact investing field and help it take root. This included helping start the Global Impact Investing Network and also the Impact Reporting and Investment Standards, or IRIS, to provide a common framework to report the performance of impact investments. And more recently, and here in Asia, we partnered with Asia Community Ventures to launch the Impact Economy Innovation Fund, a challenge that garnered over 40 proposals in countries from East and Southeast Asia, and ultimately awarded $400,000 in grants to four organizations to help foster the growth of the impact economy. And we continue to voice our support for the development of the field, working with groups that are developing policy recommendations, and letting investors of all kinds know that there's still more than enough room to jump in and put their dollars to work towards achieving social impact. I'm also excited to share with you that the Rockefeller Foundation's president, Judith Rodin, will soon release a new ebook titled The Power of Impact Investing, Putting Markets to Work for Profit and Global Good. It's co-authored by Margot Brandenburg, a former colleague of ours, and the book serves as a guide to the field, full of anecdotes, history, and practical advice, all of which points to an important truth. Anyone, from a single individual or a small group of investors or even a corporation, can be an impact investor. I'm proud of what my colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation have accomplished. We're even prouder of what our partners, many of whom are here, have accomplished. And with that, I'm going to end the celebration part of my address and move on to the agitation now. We've achieved a lot, but there's more to be done. As I've mentioned earlier, a priority for all of us to start thinking more about and innovating more about is reaching scale. There's been incredible growth in the number of enterprises that intentionally seek financial viability, social impact, and influence. These impact in, uh, enterprises and the investors that fund them have the potential to significantly enhance the well-being of poor or vulnerable populations. But too many of these enterprises struggle in their growth to continuously reduce costs and complexity and to frame opportunities for investors who are willing to invest in their growth as well as their day-to-day -day operations. So how do we break through the scale barrier. Maybe we need more ways to think about reaching scale than just growing the enterprise. For example, some impact enterprises tackle the scale barrier by connecting social entrepreneurs to with others who have already faced and met some of the challenges of achieving scale in a range of different sectors and institutions. This gives impact enterprises the capacity and knowledge, which are important forms of human capital, that they can develop internally and organically. For example, I met Teju Ravilochan about six months ago in San Francisco. He is one of the founders of the 
Unreasonable Institute, an organization that matches social entrepreneurs with accomplished mentors from the private and social sectors. Teju tells of a story when he was visiting India with his father and they came across a boy his age and his father gave him some money. And Teju just didn't understand this situation so asked his father what was happening. And his father for the first time explained to him what poverty was about and that there are some people who are working to address this problem of poverty but just weren't being very successful. Now Teju's father was a doctor and Teju knew that he went to medical school so he asked a question and this question really set Teju on the course that he has set out with the Unreasonable Institute. He asked, is there a medical school for people who want to solve poverty? And that's what the Unreasonable Institute has become, a kind of med school for entrepreneurs seeking to tackle today's greatest challenges. They learn through their mentors from people who have solved some of these challenges. They learn how to prototype solutions from people in the tech sector, and they learn how to raise money from venture capitalists who face this question all the time. So Teju has found a way to provide entrepreneurs with a different kind of growth capital, human capital, and the networks necessary to scale up any organization. Others are looking to achieve scale by creating communities of social entrepreneurs that are tackling similar problems with the idea that together their efforts can equal more than the sum of the parts. Take Ross Baird, for example, who, when working with an education-focused impact enterprises in Hyderabad, observed a paradox. There was an incredible number of talented enterprises, but there just wasn't a functioning system to support them. So in 2009, Ross started Village Capital, which recruits entrepreneurs devoted to solving problems and operates a rigorous management training program to help them find business models. At the end of each program, entrepreneurs receive investment capital through a unique peer selection method. While Village Capital's original partner programs focused on a geography, Village Capital has now evolved to take a problem-based approach, which means that they recruit entrepreneurs who are all trying to solve a similar problem, which builds a community of practice um, which has momentum and scale to make real progress. Now a third model is to take even a further step back and think in terms of enabling entire industries as opposed to a single enterprise or even a group of enterprises. In fact, the Rockefeller Foundation and others concerned about this question recently supported research by Monitor Deloitte to address this very issue. And that team just launched a fascinating report earlier this week, Beyond the Pioneer, Getting Inclusive Industries to Scale, which I understand that the Monitor Deloitte team will be speaking about here on Friday, uh, and I encourage everyone to attend that if you can. The report offers many recommendations for removing barriers to scale at the industry level, which impinge the ability of individual enterprises to grow and scale. So one example of this industry-focused and ecosystem approach is actually a Rockefeller Foundation initiative called SPEED. It's an acronym for Smart Power for Environmentally Sound Economic Development. We took a close look at one of India's most pressing problems, rural electrification. Some of you are doubtless familiar with the challenges that we found. 42,000 villages are either under-electrified or not electrified at all, which leaves 400 million people without the energy that they need to perform basic tasks, such as lighting their homes or powering small-scale equipment like irrigation pumps, which would go a long way towards improving their well-being. But at the very same time, in the very same rural regions, there's been ongoing growth in the mobile industry. This has led to the building of thousands of new cell towers in these electricity poor villages. Right now, without access to the electric grid, these cell towers are powered by dirty diesel fuel, about two billion liters every year. And the mobile industry is searching for cleaner and cheaper energy solutions. So we're exploring ways to work with communities, NGOs, the mobile industry, and other leaders to develop a game-changing new business model that would attract private sector energy service companies to build off-grid renewable energy power plants in these areas. And they would leverage the existing steady source of revenue that a cell phone tower could provide in order to enable communities to become customers as well. The bigger the overall demand, the cheaper that we can provide the supply. So when we combine cell phone tower demand and community demand, 
demand together, this is one way that benefits both parties. But there's more. With this infrastructure for electricity in place, we can also aggressively promote the development of micro-enterprises and other businesses that create jobs and secure livelihoods in rural areas. This would further boost the demand for power, making energy companies all the more eager to invest in these areas. You can start to see how the positive feedback loop that starts to develop when you take an industry perspective. It's a relatively new idea and one that we're still developing and testing, but we've already seen that this model can have real impact on people's lives. And we see our role to help support the ecosystem and market for innovations to occur in scale. And as I mentioned, while the economics are actually attractive, the potential imp for impact is what's truly exciting. I traveled with our team to a village called Bara in Bihar, which isn't fully connected to the grid. And there I met a carpenter named Temesh, who makes furniture for people in his village and surrounding villages. Now, Temesh used to cut wood using a table saw that was powered by a diesel generator. And this was expensive because of the diesel fuel, but also the fumes and the noise from this diesel engine made it very difficult for him to work uh, as long as he would have liked. Now, through some financing uh, that we helped support to convert from a diesel motor to an electric motor, and also some support for him to pay for the first six months of electricity, he's now able to get his electricity from a biomass power plant that's run by one of our partners. His energy costs have been cut in half, and he's able to produce more furniture. And the excess electricity has made it possible for his children to study at home after it gets dark. He can also now use electric hand tools to expand the range of his work, and the electric light bulb allows him to work longer. All of this from you, what you and I take mostly for granted, which is reliable electricity. But I'll be honest, despite all of this great work that I've just described, I'm still left somewhat dissatisfied that we don't systematically think about scale as much as we should. There's still a fundamental gap between the way that we in the social sector do business and the way that's done in the world of traditional entrepreneurship in the private sector. It's a gap that we need to bridge before we can see impact investing and social entrepreneurs realize the amount of change that we all aspire to. And I think it starts at the very moment that the idea for an enterprise is formed. One of the best parts of my job at the Rockefeller Foundation is meeting so many great social entrepreneurs. And typically, their starting point will be, I see a problem, and I have an idea for how to solve it. And then they imagine an organization that will implement the solution, first at a small scale, and then if it works, incrementally at larger scale. And as the social entrepreneur discovers their path to scale, they have to always invent ways to make the enterprise sustainable along the way. But before joining the Rockefeller Foundation, I was a strategy consultant who spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And over there, the starting point is usually to realize absurdly large-scale returns. They will start by saying something like, I have a rough idea for a new use for text messaging, and I want to create a billion-dollar company. My point is that for Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, reaching scale is inherently part of the initial idea. That is what attracts investment up front and gives the entrepreneurs the ability to finance their growth in addition to their day-to-day -day operations. My belief is that far too many social entrepreneurs, scale is something that they can only address after their initial idea has proven to be feasible. And I'm not at all trivializing what it is that they accomplish in this first stage. Improving schools is a lot harder than writing a new text messaging app. But scale is often not built into the wiring of the original model as much in the social sector as it is in the private sector. So what I'm wondering is how can we encourage that kind of bold thinking about realizing scale at the onset among social entrepreneurs as they develop their plans. Taken to an extreme, I'm imagining the entrepreneur who instead of starting with a theory of change about improving a school or developing a new water pump, says simply, I want to improve 100 million lives, and then figures out the best way to get it done. Now one thing is certain, if we can achieve that shift in thinking, it'll happen because of gatherings like this unconvention summit and leaders like the ones gathered here today. The same dedication that has spurred countless advancements in social entrepreneurship and innovative financing will help us do more for the people that we're all out to serve. Thank you very much and I hope you have a wonderful conference.